So what do we have to do? What's happening in my hive? Autumn, pushing towards winter. Uh, the, so the foragers, nectar out there is, is still there. Now think about autumn flow, uh, autumn honey, autumn nectar. Uh, last year, for instance, as, a, as, a, as a, a thing, I took bees to Heathcote and there was a whole lot of grey box. So it was a big honey flow in autumn. That's unusual, but sometimes some trees will flow. So autumn can be a time of honey flow, but you can't rely on it because seasons are different, flowers are different. Uh, autumn honey flow is very unreliable. So bees might be pulling something in, depending on where you are and what's out there, but you can't rely on them getting an, an autumn honey flow. So nectar is low. Uh, pollen, you will see, I'm just changing position. You will see uh, pollen coming in. If you're watching your bees, they're still bringing in a pile of pollen. So they're getting it from, from wherever it's coming from. Uh, we're happy to take it from wherever it comes from, but uh, they are bringing in pollen still, which is good because they'll, they will need it. Uh, so Australian, Australian conditions, they are unlikely to stop breeding, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they'll still be, the queen will still be laying eggs. They'll still be a, a small amount of brood usually. Sometimes you open a hive and find no brood, and it's a bit of a worry. Uh, but it just means that they've decided, uh, well, it could be genetics, that some, some breeds don't have quite as many. Uh, they, they just choose not to, not to have brood in this time of year. Uh, but it could just be they've decided they have enough bees at this time of year. Uh, so if you do open a hive and find no brood, you can panic and think, oh, there's no queen. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe they just haven't seen the need to lay. The queen hasn't laid for a while. Maybe, uh, in fact, they're doing okay. Uh, so you've got to find a queen. Difficult to know at this time of year. Um, so the workers are still foraging. Any, any warm day, you'll see them going flat out. Uh, the days are getting shorter. The weather's getting cooler, so they're more limited on the days they can get out. Days get shorter, you know, set the clocks back to daylight savings, and, uh, and so they're going out now earlier and coming back in time for tea, uh, but knocking off earlier in the day, the daylight savings. So that's the workers. Now, the queen, uh, as far as brood goes, What's she doing? Well, she lives inside the hive. She's in the dark as per usual, always in the dark, doing her own thing. And she'll generally still be doing her, doing her laying legs thing. Not as much. There'll be much fewer uh, eggs, few, much less brood at this time of year than usual. But the queen is most likely still laying. In most hives, she'll still be laying a little bit. Um, so living in the dark, doing her own thing. But now think of winter solstice, that's late June. It's not that far away. In a couple of months, she will actually start laying it. It's, it's two months away, but it's not that long away. She'll start laying again. But for now, the queen's doing very little. As far as the drones go, drones depends on condition. Um, looking at some of Joe's hives the other day, there were still drones flying there. Not many. So the, they've, they've probably stopped producing drones, but there are still drones in the hive. Um, and I, I, as I, I said to Joe the other day, uh, when we were looking at hives in, in, I think, 2018, the Varroa incursion, looking at hives around Port Melbourne to check for Varroa mites, there were drones in the middle of winter. You know, normally you would never be opening hives, so you never really see, because it's a terrible idea to open hives and be pulling brood clusters apart in the middle of winter. Terrible thing to do. But we did it because we had to. And there were not only drones in some of those hives, but there were drone, drone brood as well, which surprised me because you don't expect that in June. But there it is. So it's Australian weather conditions, uh, warm enough that, that uh, they... You might read books that talk about how they chuck drones out. Well, you'll see that in Australia sometimes too. When when the conditions suddenly drop and they're in a dearth, they will also kill drones and chuck them out. But if the conditions are okay, they won't. They'll 
keep them in there. Uh, so drones, you, there are still a few drones around. Okay, as far as the, the brood cluster, it's contracting, it's getting smaller, and the bees will actually be, as the, as the last bees hatch out around the edges of the cluster, the workers will fill up the empty cells around the edge of the cluster with honey. So there's no space for the queen to go out there and lay. They'll fill it up with honey. And so the, the honey effectively creeps in, encroaches on the brood cluster. And uh, the smaller brood cluster, smaller packed in bees, honey is actually closer in to where the brood is. Uh, yeah. Uh, are they full of stores? Yes, we hope so. Hope the bees are full of stores. So that's that's the hive condition. That uh, hopefully chopper block full. So that's that's a bit of a what's happening in my hive from uh, um, from the bees' point of view. Okay, the uh, beekeeper responsibility. So this is the next part. Having seen that, that's what's going on. So what do we have to do next? Uh, I nearly forgot to say anything about an autumn health check. Uh, remember you have a minimum responsibility, if you're a beekeeper, minimum to check your brood health at least twice a year. And we should be doing that more than twice a year, but that's at least twice a year. So generally speaking, spring, autumn, it is necessary to pull the brood cluster apart and see what's going on there. Doing Really you're doing a pests and diseases check. What's going on in there? If the brood is healthy, that's great, and you can put it back together. You're searching for fowl brood, chalk brood, hive beetles, pests and diseases. So uh, I'm not gonna spend a, a lot of time talking about pests and diseases, but as a beekeeper, that's your responsibility to learn about your, your pests and diseases and, and be on top of what, what does good brood look like checking your hive minimum twice a year and checking all the brood cluster, brood frames minimum twice a year and finding out are they all healthy or is there an issue? So that's autumn health check. If you haven't already done it, we are running out of time. And when I say running out of time, we're talking about warm weather. We're running out of warm weather really, not time, but warm weather. So you've got to get onto doing these last checks Quickly, if you haven't done it already, you've got to get in there and do it quickly before you run out of warm weather. So particularly pack down is what we were going to talk about specifically, or pack down or wintering down. What is it? What does that mean? Well, really it's all about setting up your colony for winter. That's, that's what pack down is about. Uh, in winter time, you really won't be wanting to touch them at all. You'll leave them alone for winter because if you open them up, they're going to lose a lot of heat and it takes some time to recover that heat. Best to just not touch them at all in winter time. So anything that's got to be done, we've got to do it now before we run out of warm weather. So pack down, setting up for winter. So we want number one, best condition for winter. So which involves the most bees alive, the least space because empty space takes heat to heat it up and loses, loses heat the best conditions to keep them warm and dry. Warm and dry are two different things. Um, dry is important as well as warm and full of stores, as in honey and some pollen. So that's what it is. How do we achieve it? Well, the answer of course is that depends. Depends on what hive condition you start off with. If you start off with, if you start off with three boxes, you're gonna to need to bring them down. And, and I'll talk about that for starters, because that was one of the questions that came by email. Uh, Sinjin and uh, June, hi Sinjin, g'day. Uh, the question was, uh, as I understand the question, with a hive that has two full depth brood boxes and, a, and an ideal for honey, uh, is that enough, is that what we need? Well, if I've read the question correctly, you've got three boxes and I would say, uh, with pack down, the ideal often is suggested you should pack down to one box, but two, we can choose to pack down to two, but three, I don't see any reason to keep three. Uh, if you've got three boxes, you should be bringing down at least to two, possibly to one. 
because three boxes is just unnecessary. So as I understand it, we're talking about a hive with two. Um, let me try and see whether this fits in the screen. So what is here is, is three, three boxes. Uh, got a full depth on top. You can't see my face, I hope that's all right. Full depth on top, and th three boxes, too much. Here's a full depth. We're going to, let's say that two of these are full depth. If this, if the top one's full of honey and we want to keep a honey box, okay, we're going to keep a honey box. We'll put that aside. But if we've got two brood boxes, we want to get rid of at least one of them. So we're going to go through these two boxes and try and find at least eight frames to get rid of. Now, you might say, oh, they've all got something on them. Well, yep. They will all have something in them. And some of them will have honey, but some of them might have a little bit of honey. Some of them might be empty. That's easy. Get rid of them. We want to pull it down from two boxes down to max. Sorry, from three boxes down to maximum two because three is just too much. There's no requirement for three. So we're going through those two boxes on a warm day. Get get your warm weather uh, and go through. Pull out any empty ones. If we can get rid of eight empty frames, beautiful. Uh, obviously, any brood frames, any frames that have got brood in there, they're going to need to stay. But you're probably only going to find four or less, four or less frames of brood. So um, uh, pulling, pulling out as many empty ones as you can, pulling out any that have got unsealed brood, uh, sorry, unsealed nectar, honey. Uh, unsealed nectar can ferment. It probably got too high a uh, content. Sometimes the bees will rush to cap it at the at the end of autumn and, and you just cap it over, even though the water percentage is too high. So you really don't want unsealed honey, unsealed nectar in there. Get rid of that if you can. Uh, next question might come, what if you've got a frame that's got some brood and also got some unsealed nectar well that's okay if you put the brood in um, they're probably going to eat that first because it's closest to the brood nest so chances are they will they will get rid of that sooner anyway but any unsealed honey any unsealed nectar that's not close to the brood nest or that doesn't have brood in it pull it out replace keep only full frames in there um, so do I need to take off boxes? Yes, a couple of reasons here. Let's talk about why. Why are we packing down to one if possible? The first obvious thing is that the more space there is to heat, the more heat loss. If you've got bigger, if you've got two boxes or three boxes, you're gonna lose a whole lot of heat there. And heat is what they need. They need to burn energy. And, and I have read that a if you do decide to keep a, a a double, two, two boxes of, of bees, they will probably burn through more honey in the winter than a single box would because they're, they're using more of their honey for heat production, for, for energy. So two, two, keeping two boxes will probably require more honey than one box. So keeping them warm and dry, uh, the, the smaller space, the better. Uh, if you've got two boxes, if you decide to keep two boxes for whatever reason, you would want ideally keep eight full frames of honey if you've got two boxes, eight full frames. If you pack them down into one, then you'd be looking for five or six frames of honey. So imagine that you're pulling apart a hive and you see, let's, let's say you see three frames of brood. There's probably a little bit of, on the, you've probably got one full frame of brood and a couple of frames with partly brood, partly honey. Uh, so there's, let's call that half a frame of honey on each, so there's one. Then you add in five full frames of honey, then you've got five to six frames. And that, would, that should be enough in Australian conditions to get them through the winter, should be. If you keep two boxes on, two full depths, then they probably will burn through eight frames of honey. And if you say that's fine, well, all right then. Um, 
Next question, what if you got in there and found you didn't have that many frames, if you haven't got it? Now, I don't want to talk about feeding for too long, uh, but I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll quickly show some feeders. If you get in and find, you know, you're looking for five or six frames and you haven't got it, you're going to need to feed soon. Soon because feeding sugar, if you have to, uh, if you have to do it, they need warm weather to evaporate the water out. This season's been so good in the Arrow Valley. If you've had the bees in good shape in the Arrow Valley and you haven't pinched their honey, you should have plenty of the, the bees' own honey to keep them going through. So they should be all right. But let's say that uh, uh, some, some, for some reason, maybe they'd lost a queen. They were without a queen for a month and they were in poor condition. Uh, something went wrong or a late split, something like that, and they haven't got that stores that they need. Or maybe you pinched too much honey and you shouldn't have left so much, you shouldn't take so much. Uh, let's say you've got a feed. I'll show you quickly a couple of different uh, different types of feeder. And I'll, let's have a look. Frame feeder. And I won't talk much about them, just, I'm just showing different kinds of feeders. Here's that frame feeder goes in the box. You have feeders that go that sit inside. There's a there's a homemade one with holes drilled in it, fill it up with honey. The bees will take the, the honey out of it. There's an entrance feeder that slots in the entrance. Uh, so oh, and even this, even this here can sit right in into the hive. And even that can be used as a feeder. All different kinds of, of ways of feeding. And all they are different methods of delivering the same thing, delivering sugar into the hive. Hopefully, if you've had a good season, and most people in the Arrow Valley have, hopefully you don't even need to worry about feeding. But if you do, there's lots of ways to do it. Get the, if you discover that you haven't got enough stores, and you have to feed sugar, get it into them quickly because they need warm weather to evaporate that out. They don't eat dry sugar very well. They need syrup to be able to consume it, and then they've got to get rid of the water, so that's a problem. So, um, so if you've got to feed, if you need to feed, do it early. Hopefully in the Yarra Valley this season, this season we shouldn't need to. Last year was so poor that everyone was feeding. This season, hopefully, you're all good. A um, couple of reasons why they say pack down into one preference to two. Uh, obviously, yeah, more, space, more space means more heat loss. Um, the whole idea that the bees will try to fill up empty cells. So they, the idea of if they see there's a whole lot of empty space in there, they're going to try and fill it up. They're going to fly when they'd be better off staying home. If you've got one single box packed down tight, and the bees look around and say, ah, yes, you pretty chockers, we'll be right. And they stay at home, which is, that's what you want. You want them to stay at home. You know, there's no reason to them for them to fly if they've, if they've loaded up with honey. So uh, having empty space encourages them to fly when they shouldn't. Um, winter nectar, if they are getting winter nectar, it's often not a very good quality nectar. So it's very watery, so not good for them anyway. Uh, can encourage nosema, etc., and we don't want to chill them off. Um, yeah, so what we want to do, we want to create conditions where the bees uh, look around and say, yeah, we choppers will just stay home and uh, keep their maximum numbers best condition for spring. Winter is basically just a, a slowdown. We want them to be in the best condition for spring, so we don't want to be you know, desperately trying to fly around in wintertime and end up dying from that. And the other thing is that when they are in a cluster, they're going to stay in one pack, they've got to be able to reach the stores. So it's better if the stores are in one area rather than spread. Okay. Um, have I said enough about that stuff? So all your brood will go in. Any uncapped honey, get out if you can. Empty frames, get out if you can. What to do with storing them? Storing frames. What if you pull out uh, half full frames, what are you going to do with them? Some people keep them in the freezer. It's not necessary to keep them all winter in the freezer. 
if you put them in the freezer for a few days, that's about killing off wax moth bugs and hive beetle eggs. Um, by getting rid of that, storing the frames in the freezer for a little while, uh, that kill the eggs, you can then pack them tight in a shed. If you just seal it up in the shed, in winter time, they'll probably be all right in the shed because the beetles are unlikely to find them inside a building, the wax moths also, and both beetles like hot and humid, wax moths like hot and dark. So if you've got them in winter time in a cool area, less likely to have any pest trouble. So you should be able to, after you put them in the freezer for a few days, should be able to just lock them up in the shed. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you some frames with, with uh, talking about wax moth later. Stickies, what to do with stickies. Again, um, feed them off if you can. Feed them onto the hive, let them clean out. The, you can flip them upside down is a, a useful idea. Helps encourage the bees to pull them out. Leave a mat. Put them, leave the mat on top of the hive and put the stickies upside down on top of that. Hopefully the bees will pull all that honey out of that and take it down. Uh, that's, the, that's the theory, they'll take it all down. Uh, and then once it's empty, you can get it off. Uh, yeah, I see we've been going for nearly half an hour and I've only answered one or two questions. Um, quickly talk about weighing, hefting things. Yeah, there goes the thing. Here's a baseboard and just what you can see in the end there is that oh, video's a bit dodgy. What's there, if you if you can see it, is a, no, oh, can't see that. Let's try that. It's just a staple. And that's just one way of hooking something in there. Here's a pair of, of old scales, just El Cheapo luggage scales that hook into the, the back there. Now what that means is you can use that, you can put that in uh, and get an idea of what the hive weighs or the, the relative weight of the back end of it. By doing that, you can even write that down and it will help to show you how the bees are using, how much stuff, how much stores they've got left, how they're using it. Uh, just a cheap set of luggage scales will do because it doesn't have to be an accurate measure. It's just, uh, it's just letting you know how they're doing, are they burning through it? But if you're not actually recording it, you can just do the same thing by lifting it. Just get a hold of it, lift it up, and and uh, if you do it at the start of winter, you say, oh yeah, that's pretty heavy. I know that they've got heaps of stores and that's heavy. Then get into June, July, August, and you lift it up and it's very light, then you know that maybe they need, if you just remember, just lock it in your head, how heavy they are when they've got lots of stores, then when they're very light, then you know that maybe you might might need to feed them in springtime. That would be the time that you could pull out those half full frames that you had stashed away and slip them in, pull out some empty ones in uh, in early spring, get out the empties and put some half full ones in to make sure they've got food for, for spring. Uh, pests and diseases. I'll show you a couple of frames. Dirty old brown frames like this. I'll try and get the get it in the camera. No, camera's rejecting it. Dirty old brown frames. This is what wax moths love. Old brown, dirty ones. They're not really interested in fresh new frames. Although here is one that is foundation, and the and the wax moths have damaged this. Probably because it was sitting around somewhere, sitting in a box, and, and maybe it was sitting next to a dirty old brown frame. Wax moth will eat clean, even foundation, good clean uh, frames. However, usually they're not interested. They really, they're really going for these dirty old brown ones. If a good frame is next to one of these, it'll probably get attacked by the, the, the moths from next door. But uh, if you're storing this kind of frame, um, you might you might question 
do I really want to keep this dirty old brown one? This is, this is not filthy. This could last another year or two, but you might decide, well, rather than leave it for the moths, I'll chop that out and melt it down. Eventually you want to do that anyway. You don't want to leave them too old and too black. Beetles, you won't have too much trouble with beetles in this time of year because the cold weather, they'll slow down. There's still some out there and they will actually still be in the hive. But generally speaking, they stay in the hive and uh, the bees just keep them under control. Hate the fact that they're there, but they, they're unlikely to cause much trouble at this time of year. An unusual one is mouse damage. See that this has been sitting on top of a uh, entrance, on top of the baseboard, and walking up to a hive and seeing this, you can see that it's been chewed away. Pretty obvious it was chewed away by mice or rats. What's going on there? Uh, you'll read in books, American, European books, that mice and rats cause trouble. They don't so much in Australia because the weather is warm enough that the bees are awake all the time. That hive, you see that, and uh, the mice have gone in there to try and get the pollen more than the honey. You see that and your hive is dead, pretty much. You, you can expect that they're dead when you see something like that. Not very common, uh, but uh, just to show that you might read in American or European books, trouble with mice, we don't have too much trouble in Australia because, of, because the bees are still alive and are not just alive, awake, even through winter. So if you see mouse damage like that, you know you're going to find something horrible when you open the hive. Uh, it's been, I think, it's a bit over half an hour, so I'll quickly um, answer a question or two that were, that were asked before. One was relating to wasps attacking and, and somebody was worried that if there's wasps hanging around and the neighbour had a trap saying, will the bees be attracted to the trap? That all depends on the bait. Of course, yes, yes, they will be attracted if it's a sugary bait. Uh, wasps, European wasps can be attracted to meat or rotten fruit or all kinds of things uh, that bees are not attracted to. So it all depends on your what bait the neighbour is using in that trap. As to, but yes, yes, if he uses a sugary bait, it might kill bees too. Um, a question about aggressive bees. Uh, so uh, uh, The question came in that um, bees have been more aggressive than last time they opened them. Now, he didn't say in the question how long ago they were opened up. We did have an issue earlier this season because the messmate was out that, that messmate flower does make bees angry and uh, a bit aggressive and, and stroppy. So depending on when you open it up, that might be it. Um, make sure they've got plenty of feed, make sure they're not being attacked by beetles and not being attacked by other things. If they seem like they've got plenty of stores, come back to them in spring and, and if they're still aggressive in spring, you may need to replant. But hopefully they'll be all right. Uh, so, I've probably talked enough. Um, do we have so, questions to go? So Phil, there's quite a lot of questions that have come in, which is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, we might start at the top. There's is about 10 questions, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we have, um, can frames with unsealed honey be stored without a problem? Can they be stored? There is a problem, and that is they might ferment. So there's not a lot you can do about it. If it's really, really runny, you might be better off to just shake the runny nectar out on the ground and store them. If it's so runny that you can shake it out, it's probably better to do it that way and, and keep them relatively empty rather than risk having a, a fermentation problem. Someone said that um, last winter they stored, Tracy says that last winter she stored four partially filled frames in the freezer and then gave it back to them in spring and it worked well. Sounds okay. Good. Well, that's good as long as they, they're, the concern is fermentation, but uh, if they're in the, uh, perhaps they don't ferment in the in the freezer, yeah. if the fermentation is some kind of uh, bacteria type stuff, um, whatever, whatever. There's another question. Ferment. Do you put the frames you are um, removing next to the hive so the remaining bees can go back in? 
is when you're packing down and removing the frames for winter. Ah, so if you're taking off a box or taking off some frames, um, I would usually shake them off, uh, but then you might have a few that are still stuck on the frames. Shake them off, brush them off. If you're not happy with that, um, or you're not uh, confident to do that, another way to do it is a clearer board. Uh, get the, the frame, get the whole box that you want to remove with a clearer board. And a clearer board is just a board with one way exits in it so the bees can go down and not come back. You can put a clearer board on top of the hives of the boxes that are staying, put the box you're removing on top of the clearer board, and theoretically by tomorrow the bees will go down into the hive come back the next day and take it off and theoretically there shouldn't be any bees left inside there. Thanks, Phil. Um, just a question for everyone also, if you wanted to um, change your view back to everybody so that you can see who's talking, um, you can use speaker view or participant view right up in the top right hand corner. Um, Walter has a question about, uh, oh no, sorry, Bernie first, is it, is it advisable to store full frames of honey rather than extract? Um, some people say store them for this point of the year, store them so that when you get to your pack down and you open up and say, oh, I've got half full frames, uh, pull out the half full ones and put the full ones in. Uh, there's not a whole lot of reason for storing full frames over winter. Uh, but if, if you've stored them up until now, you might want to, put them in in replace to, to get rid of half full frames and, and fill the hive before winter. Thanks, Phil. There's another one. What about ants? Have people found hassles with ants when storing frames? It's from Walter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ants is always a problem. Uh, we never get a really satisfactory solution for ants. Some people suggest cinnamon sprinkled around or all around the place uh, but I've also seen ants ignoring the cinnamon so uh, not a very satisfactory thing uh, I guess you've got to find out where those ants are coming from and uh, try and try and stop the ants rather than uh, there's not a lot you can do well, but so, there's another way is sitting the hive or sitting the box on top of uh, buckets of water kind of thing, yeah, but that's a bit extreme. Remember, if anyone would also like to add to the answer or have anything to say, you can you can raise your hand. So you go over to participants and click raise hand. Uh, the next question, Phil, would be, um, this is from Luke. When you, um, when you melt down old fra black frames, how do you separate the cocoons from the wax? Okay, so melting wax, yeah. So if it comes to this point of year and you've got old frames that you want to get rid of that, you, that wax moss will probably ruin anyway and you want to melt down your old brown frames you pulled out, melt down some capping, um, there, there's quite a few things on YouTube you can Google and you'll see people suggesting uh, melt it in usually above water. Get in an old pot, or a dirty old pot that you don't need for cooking because it's hard to clean, uh, melt it all down with water underneath and, and then uh, pour through a strainer and, and a simple strainer is chuck squat. So that's one way of doing it and try and squeeze the water and wax through it. That's, that's a way it's pretty easy to do with minimum equipment. Uh, another way is to, if you've got a big boiler or an old urn of some sort, boil it all up in an old boiler and then use a, a strainer, a, a, like a solid stainless steel strainer, uh, stick it into the wax mixture, into the goop, and let the wax come through the strainer and scoop it out into a mould is a different way of doing it. So there's a couple of ways that you can do. Um, that's the kind of thing you can probably find on YouTube, find, find some uh, people showing ideas of what sort of ordinary backyard kitchen equipment you can use. Um, don't use good kitchen equipment because it'll end up dirty and unusable in the kitchen. Thanks, Phil. If anyone else has any um, suggestions or any more questions, please keep typing them in. 
There's another one that is, uh, David asks, what is the lowest temperature we can undertake inspections pre-winter? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, 19 degrees is ideal. 17 degrees is, is pushing a bit further. Some people will talk about 13 degrees as a, as a temperature, you, it's okay to pop a lid, take a look. So we're not talking about stripping the brood frames apart, uh, but pop a lid, see how, much, see how many bees are down there, see how many, you know, look down between the frames. Are they full of capped honey down through the frames or is it empty? Um, down 13 degrees, I've heard some people say, Below that, then you just no, don't touch it. Uh, but that when I, when I say thirteen degrees, that's just for take a quick squeeze, see what's in there, put the lid back on. Um, as for for pulling them apart, uh, for a, for a full on health check and, and brood check, uh, I'd be talking seventeen minimum. And there's uh, one from Linda, Phil, that is, uh, do mice eat wax moth? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Not sure. Not 100% not sure. But uh, I can imagine a mouse finding a wax moth larvae and thinking that'd be a pretty good tucker, I reckon. Not 100% not sure of that. Uh, the other one is, uh, what is what is the preferred width for the hive entrance over winter? That's a good one. Oh, good question, yes. Um, there is no reason to have a wide entrance. Uh, on my hives, I have a little swinging door on most of them, and I close it down very close. Uh, there's no reason why you need a wide entrance in winter time. Um, so to put a figure on it, call it, 25, 30 mil would be plenty. Uh, three, four, five bees could go through that width at a time. No reason to be any wider than that in winter time. Um, that gets onto the question of winter conditions and we'll certainly talk more about that next time, I think. Uh, but uh, wind, just thinking generally about your hive position, is it gonna get uh, cold wind blowing in? Is it gonna get winter sun? Those are, those are things to think about now and observe as the, as the sun changes position, as the winter weather comes in. Are they gonna get a lot of wind? Are they gonna get any sun or no sun? Um, and maybe think about changing their position to combat that. Uh, but as far as the hive entrance, very small at this time of year, they don't need to be wide. Thanks, Phil. Um, there's another one, to melt old frames, if enough sun using a solar melter, oh, this is a, 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 a answer, it sounds like. To melt old frames, if enough sun using a solar melter, then further refine by enclosing with fabric, boiling in hot water at the end, getting pure wax disc floating on the top of the water. So a little bit further of what you spoke about, Phil. Mm. Um, David and Liz are saying, we have a 10 frame box and the frames are not full for this first winter. Should we take out empty frame and pack the empty space? If so, what do you suggest? Yes, that's a possibility. If, like, Ideally, if you had full frames stacked in the shed or in the freezer, then put the full frames in. But yes, if you're saying you haven't got anything to put in place, um, if you've got, say, five or six full five or six full frames of honey but you've got a 10 frame box and, and extra space uh, then you can pack that you could use polystyrene but bees chew polystyrene uh, so not so great um, unless it's unless it's uh, high density polystyrene like the stuff they make beehives out of but the stuff you get out of packing is usually low density so nice insulation but bees chew it um, a better idea might be some old newspapers. Uh, then that's what they, that's been used for many years to uh, stack up three or four old newspapers and newspapers take up, uh, take up the space pretty well and are a reasonable insulation if you, if you pack it to the size of the empty space. Uh, cost nothing, 
um, easy to roll, easy to slip into the space, and at the end of the season, just chuck them in the, in the recycling. The one, can you pack down from three boxes to one box in one go, or should it be done in stages? That's from Steve. No, in one go is in in one go will be fine. Um, and yes, time-wise, take take the warm day and do it. Get it all done in one go. Um, and bees, a huge number of bees will squeeze into one box. As long as as long as you've got all uh, brood and honey, maybe a smidgen of pollen around the brood, um, and a huge number of bees will squeeze into one box. You, you'll be surprised how many bees will squeeze in there. Uh, Walter asks, some friends have told me that they put straw bales around the hive in winter. Do many people do this? Uh, I don't actually know. I, I, I've sometimes used bits of old insulation and, and make a little jacket for the bees, a little bit of molly coddling. Hot hay is a good idea. If you've got hay bales, yeah, sure. Um, I don't think I'd have to throw that to anyone else out there add in a comment if you if you also have done that. Um, is it a good idea? Yeah, sure. Um, if you had a thousand hives, you might not want to do that because it's too much work. But if you've got one or two in the backyard, yeah. Um, a bit of hay around it would be a nice bit of insulation on the outside, yeah. Uh, we have, am I muted? No. We have, um, Something from Patrick and Veronique. We have two flow hives. It is recommended to extract and leave the frame open for the bee to clean. Would you still put the escape board at the same time? An escape board um, with, with flow frames that are cracked. And no, if you have an escape board, the bees can't get up into it. So you need to leave that open initially so the bees can get up there and clean it out. Um, you, you might use the escape board after they've done the cleanup and you want to get the bees out of it. Uh, but initially, they if you put an escape board on to begin with, they can't get into it to start to, uh, to do anything to clean it up. Um, Patrick and Veronique, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question to Phil if you like, if that if there was more to it, I was just wondering if I have if I could do it in one go instead of going uh, over a couple of days to actually annoy the bees. If if you could do, if, so I, if I was if I was extracting the honey, the, the, the you know, and then putting by the end of the day putting the uh, escape board, and then I wouldn't have to annoy the bees anymore for for a bit. Okay, so you, if you like, crack the flow frames in the morning, yep, uh, and left them cracked, yep. and then put the put the escape board on at the at night time. Yeah, well, at, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, uh, I think you, I think that would probably work, and you could probably do that and take the take the box off in the morning, and that would probably work. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I have, um, there's a question from Henny. I have just removed my flow frame box, but lifted it off the hive for bees to clean it. Henny, do you want to unmute yourself and add to that? I'm sorry, it might've been out of context of what we were talking about. We were just talking about flow frames before. Um, and my question to Phil is, uh, if the bees, if you've uh, extracted the honey from the flow frames, and in my case, I had some hybrid frames as well. But the question is, when they clean it, where do they put that honey that's left over? So I, I actually lift it off and put it about six or eight metres away from the hive and let the bees remove it, and then they can do with it uh, whatever they need to do with it. But if you leave the the flow box on the hive. I just wonder if they're going to put it back into the flow frames again. Yes, that sometimes happens with stickies and, and whether it's flow frames or ordinary frames, yes, sometimes they store it back there. But here's my problem with what you're saying there. Uh, basically, you, you're putting it out 
for not just those bees in your backyard, but any bees in the in the area to rob. So you're that really is uh, it's it's a it's a biosecurity problem. Uh, yes, sounds like a great idea, and yes, we used to do it very convenient way of cleaning the honey out and recycling honey, but it's a biosecurity problem. It's it's a, a disease risk uh, that uh, even if your bees haven't got um, initially haven't got foul brood, they might get it by having all these feral coming around and, and, and spreading it through what's going on. Uh, so yes, lovely idea in terms of getting the boxes clean, but it's a biosecurity problem, you can't do it. Thanks, Phil. Uh, there's a comment from Kath and Jim to say, make sure you have wind protection um, for your hive over winter, shade cloth maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you, particularly if you know that the area is prone to wind, yeah. And Walter's idea of hay bales, if you've got hay bales available, yeah, nice idea. And so does, does hay does hay go rotten? Someone's asking. Is hay any good substitute for straw, or does it go rotten? Uh, are they talking about inside as a packer or outside as an insulator? I'm not sure. This is from Rowan. Rowan, would you like to mute yourself and unmute yourself and ask Phil? Yeah, actually, it was in the context of using it in the roof uh, of the actual hives. But yeah, I look at the, the question next to it. It's talking about use of uh, hay around the hives. So I guess there's two questions in there. Hmm. Well, that sounds very much like the, the Ware. If you want to read up on that, Ware uh, hives use uh, a an insulation, I uh, can't remember what they call it, a mat, a, well, a mat, but is the word they use for it, but it's it's really a layer of, of uh, hay and stuff that soaks up condensation and, and is an insulation layer. Uh, and I'm pretty sure they use hay that's part of the plan. So if you want to read up on Ware hives, uh, that's, that's part of their, I think they have it in their year round. And whether they chuck it away at the end of the season, I'm not sure. But, but it's, it's, it would be all right to have it in there. Great, thank you. No worries, Rowan. Jim and Kath would like to add something there, I think. Joe, um, bee wise don't recommend using hay. They recommend using straw. It's less likely to rot inside the hive. Inside the hive, yeah. Thanks, Jim. Dry, uh, dry straw rather than grass hay. Yes. Okay. Right. Thanks, Jim. And while I'm thinking of Jim and Kath, um, before I forget to say it, honey sales. Uh, we are waiting on some labels for the honey co-op honey. Uh, once we get the labels, there'll be honey available. So just throwing that in before I forget, uh, and we'll we'll put that on Facebook when that's ready to to arrange. If anyone's interested in buying honey co honey. I'm sure everyone will be. Thanks, Bill. Um, we have a question from David. Um, can or should you continue to feed sugar syrup through winter when you don't have a strong full hive? To continue to feed it, uh, yes. Uh, for instance, uh, lost it. Um, This one here uh, is a uh, an entrance feeder. Just changing to okay, an entrance feeder that just slips into the into the entrance, and you can see just a plastic bottle. You can see when they've finished it, and uh, when it's empty, you can put another one in if they need. It. Yeah, if if your bees need to be fed, can you keep on feeding all through winter? Well. If they need it, they need it. Um, if you get to winter time and find the bees are starving, well, hopefully that won't happen if you started off with lots of honey. But if you did get through and uh, and find that there's um, that they've run out of stores for whatever reason, if they need it, they need it. The problem with feeding is water. Uh, dry sugar, they don't eat very well. They they'll eat it if they're starving to death, but they don't 
they, they're not able to eat dry sugar very well. So you've got to mix it up in the syrup. Even if you make it as thick as possible, which is two, two parts sugar, one part water is about as thick as you can make it. Um, otherwise it, it just doesn't dissolve. It stays in saturation, solution, whatever, whatever the word is. Uh, it's past saturation, yeah. Um, they can drink that syrup, but once they drink it, they've got to get rid of the water. And that is the issue that in winter time is, uh, uh, you, could, you could keep feeding them sugar, but they've got to get rid of the water somehow. And if the weather is cold, how do they evaporate it? That's the problem. They're, they're losing heat. You're feeding them because they're short on, on food, but they're losing heat by uh, half their heat is being used to evaporate water out of the, the syrup. And so it's, it's not, a good, not a good situation. If you've got to, you've got to, because if they're, if they're starving, you've got to feed them. But the problem with continuing to feed is what are they going to do with all that water? Well, that's great, Phil. I don't, I don't think there's any more questions. We just want to say goodbye to Joe. He's just left us saying thank you. Um, does anyone else, um, you're welcome to unmute and just ask a question if you have any. It is one, it is one, oh, 2 30 now. So uh, we probably haven't got too much longer, but you're welcome to um, ask a question if you do. Any questions? Does the committee have anything they wanted to say? Any reminders? Okay, okay so, uh, oh, Linda. If anyone's got any library books still out, you can always return them to me at my house at uh, Kilsyth um, or Post Office Box 359 in Kilsyth, 3137. Um, and I will store them until we get back. Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, we also just wanted to uh, to say uh, if you have any suggestions of any any other topics you would like to hear from, we're still working with the speaker that was planned for our um, May meeting, but we'll just um, take any suggestions people have of things that are coming up over winter. So send them through to to our email address if you wouldn't mind. Um, and Phil, is that all you would like to say? Will we? That's say goodbye awesome. and thank everybody. If we haven't bored people to death, then uh, that's all good. I, th I actually think it worked quite well. So thank you to everyone for being fantastic and for Phil for all your amazing knowledge and sharing. If anyone's got any questions, we also put in the newsletter that if you've got, we're starting a QA um, on a, in our newsletter and on our website. If you'd like to ask any questions, send them through. Okay, I can see lots of people using thumbs up, which is really nice. Thank you so much. Um, so if not, we'll see you all um, next meeting. We will continue to do these, obviously, through COVID. So um, we'll let you know when we can all see you, see you in person. Thanks, everybody. Great effort, Joe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone. Thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you very Thanks, much. Bye-bye.